I am really glad to be here today. Pi Data is one of my favorite conferences because numeric computing and numeric computing and data oriented computing is one of the real, mo the most important parts of the entire Python ecosystem. And it really comes close to my heart because one of the things that uh, Travis didn't mention is that my hobby uh, in terms of programming is actually around computational linguistics. Uh, a couple of years ago, I I mapped the entire uh, United States patent database in an effort to be find better prior art. And that sort of brought me into the world of scientific computing. And since then, I've really been working on it. Now, that's strictly sort of a medium data problem. You know, my, my core data set is only a couple hundred gig. But it still was enough, and it keeps me occupied to this day. Now, today, I'm here to tell you a story. This is a story of the weak overthrowing the strong. This is a story of the, of all the common, of, of the common reaching out and seizing the means of production to overthrow those who have previously controlled, previously controlled those means of production and to become rich by doing so. And so I talked to, I said this to somebody and they said, you're going to come to Microsoft and you're going to give a talk about Marxist philosophy. And I said, yes, <laughs> except this isn't really about political and social philosophy. This is about data. And when I talk about the means of production, I am talking about computation. And when I'm talking about the raw materials, I'm not talking about labor. I'm talking about the data and the way in which it is, where it is located and what you can do with it. But like any good Marxist talk, you have to start with history. This is ENIAC. It's generally thought of as the first uh, stored program computer. Uh, although there are plenty of people who would challenge that in various ways and say, no, this one was earlier or whatever. This is a, as, as good a starting place as any. Now, sometime back, there was this idea of comparing different types of computers by looking at the time it would take to accomplish a particular instruction or series of instructions and how many of those you could do per second. Uh, this was the, the instructions per second. You know, now we know it as MIPS. Uh, if you looked at a Linux kernel booting back in the late 90s, they would list so-and-so BOGO MIPS, and they renamed it from MIPS to BOGO MIPS because this is a completely bogus measurement. It doesn't actually really tell you what you think it's telling you, but it is an interesting enough measurement that we can use it to trace the perspective of history and computing over time. Now, ENIAC was blazingly fast. It was so fast that it could do a total, it, it, it could do about 35 instructions per second. That is 0 0.0000002 MIPS. But even at the time, that was groundbreaking because the computer it replaced, the Mark I, was an analog computer that could do one of these equivalent instructions every six seconds. So this was approximately 1,000 times faster. And that was, again, an order or two of magnitude faster than the human computers, which the Mark I replaced or supplemented. And so to give you an idea of the relative speeds of how much this first computer changed, what it would, they, the very first program it ran took 20 minutes. The output of this program was then, was then checked by, by people with mechanical calculators. It took 40 hours. Now, this is, well, what about data? Well, ENIAC, if you wanted to input data into ENIAC, it could only store about 20 numbers at a time. And so what you would do is you would go through and you would manually uh, create your, your data flow by plugging in patch tables everywhere, everywhere and turn the proper input knobs, and then you would run, run things. And you had to bring the data to ENIAC because ENIAC was huge. I looked up a couple stats on it. It contained 17,468 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, 1,500 relays, 6,000 manual switches, and 5 million different solder joints. Solder joints. It, it covered 1,800 square feet of floor space, weighed 30 tons, 
consumed 160 kilowatts of electrical power, and you could literally park a bus in the middle of the computer. So the important thing, though, here is that you had to bring the data to ENIAC because there was only one. And it was so big, it was never, ever, ever going to move. And this idea of bringing the data to the computer continued even as computers started to mature through the, the 50s, through the 60s, and the 70s. This is a picture of a, one of those glass-walled glass -walled central computing facilities that was very, very common, especially on Wall Street in the late 70s. What would happen is if you were in a university or if you were on Wall Street or the few other places like the oil industry that used computing, you would submit your program to the IT folks who would run it for you, the data processing folks. And sometimes a week or two later, they would give you back your result. And if you had a bug in the program or didn't do what you wanted, you would go through and get your set of punch cards and you would rework it and you would submit it again. Again, look at where the data was. The data was brought to the computer because these things were big and they were they had a staff that was dedicated to this idea of feeding them data because only by feeding this centralized computer the data were you able to get back the information that you needed in order to make decisions. But a couple interesting things started to happen as computers became more powerful. Um, and a lot of these started to happen right around 1980. So, of course, the most, uh, let's see, wow. That's the glass wall room. Am I behind? OK, that's Enia. That's the glass wall thing. Evidently, I skipped a slide. Um, but what this was going to be, it was going to be a picture of the, one of the 1980s PCs uh, by IBM. And two interesting ha things happened with the IBM PC. The first is that this was the first PC where the data was designed to be primarily processed locally. Uh, there was this idea that people would really want to have their electronic recipe book and store it, in the, store it on their computer in the kitchen. Now this is crazy because I don't know how many of you have ever had a computer in your kitchen um, and had it, been, had it open for, you know, for checking while you're trying to cook. This, is not, this frequently does not end happily. But this was, this was this idea, and the spreadsheets that really drove a lot of the business use. This was, again, process the data locally and then put out the information. The other thing is that computers started to become networked. And so you, be, so you started to exchange things much more easily, in information and results much more easily between them. Ethernet was developed in the late 70s. And then, and modems became standard equipment probably by about, or at least a standard option, probably by about 1983-84. That's when we had our first computer and it came with a modem as a standard option. Now, people have, here have been able to observe the changes since that time. Uh, we've observed the change where almost every household in the developed world has a computer and for most of us in this room, I would dare say we probably have more than one. Um, I'd say that for many of us, we have more computers than we have cars or TVs. Uh, and this is sort of only the strict definition of computers. But in today's world, we don't just have access to computers as we thought of it back then. We also have access to phones and to tablets and to all sorts of things. And we, in looking forward to the future, expect that more and more things are going to become imbued with computer-like intelligence because we're putting computers in them. So I thought it would be interesting that start to graph what does the power of computing look like over time. And so this is uh, a totally, totally, uh, the, these are billions of, giga, billions of gigamips, which is, and this was very, very rough data, but the trend is very clear. Uh, PC sales aren't linear, and they're currently in decline, but they're still, on average, more powerful than ever. 
But what happens is that because of what's commonly known as Moore's law, this ability to have more and more transistors, we are seeing an increase in the power of the computing infrastructure as a whole. And what's more, individual compute power associated with an individual CPU is becoming more and more powerful. This is the graph of, again, MIPS, a bogus measurement, but MIPS, over, uh, MIPS on a single core over time. And this is, this is the well-known well exponential graph. Now, one of the things that is said frequently is that one of the things that's impossible for human minds to fully comprehend is the power of an exponential function. And that is because we think of things growing linearly, or at least geometrically. But this idea that things will double tomorrow or over a very short time simply blows our mind. So, if you looked at the total manufactured, uh, if you took, look at the total manufactured core, cores, and you look at the power per core, then you can start looking at them. And each year, CPUs get faster and GPUs get faster, and more and more gadgets are sold. And so, you can actually get an idea of what does the total computing power look like that has that is currently addressable at any time, because you can actually create a measurement of how much stuff has been ma manufactured and how powerful were those things, and you can look at it. And the graph, uh, that's PC sales, looks like something else. Uh, so, like I said, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So I mentioned that the thing, that's in, the thing that's interesting is that we don't really understand this idea of an exponential function. The reason why that it matters is because you can look at this, the set of all computing power that has ever been created ever and, what, and the amount of it that was created last year. And as those, who, those of you who are watching closely saw, the amount of in the amount of computing power that was created last year was approximately 40% of all the computing power that has ever been in the world from the dawn of time. And what's more, uh, what's more, this is only going to increase. And so what, how does this break out? Well, it turns out that the vast majority of these are still PC sales, PC power, because PCs are far, far more powerful than the phones and the tablets and the little IoT devices that are out there. But things are moving up relatively quickly. So how can we estimate this? Compute architectures and software are vastly different. And there's the, there's the issue of not only of how you, the, the compute core itself, but the memory pathway, which is an increasingly important part of the total bandwidth. because Ever since actually the 60s, compute cores have been significantly faster than any, any of the memory that they access, even, the on, even some of the very fastest on-chip flip-flops. It still causes a minor stall of the, on the order of a, 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 a cycle or two in order to get information that's even right there on the chip. But if you look at synthetic measurements associated with, say, 7-zip or AES or some, some of these other things that you can do that are designed to work identically across different uh, types of computers and across different, uh, different places and have an identical output, you can start to extrapolate the relationship over time and you can actually do these comp a comparison of total compute power, uh, total compute power and look at it, look at it versus on, look at it associated with both PCs and the various mobile and IoT devices. Now, IoT, I'm going to, I keep on mentioning it. For the most part, if, unless you ex include the little, like, uh, the, the microcontrollers which are out there, of which there are a metric ton, I'm going to be largely excluding IoT in a lot of, the, in a lot of these calculations because there just aren't a lot of those out there right now. We expect that those are going to be big, those are going to be important, but right now, the really growing trend is associated with, uh, associated with mobile. Now, if you look at this, how much of it is not just, 
it's not just how much computing that a particular device has, but we also want to look at how much com total computing is not just out there, but how much can I address at this particular time? Because certain things have been in there. You can't send a, computer, a program to ENIAC anymore. And there are, whole lots of, there are a whole bunch of things that are just not networked in, not available. So how much can we address? And it is, and what's interesting is that the new compute power that is coming online is becoming more and more significant. And so if you look at the cumulative power, you see the, we are already in the position where what's coming online each and every year is far more significant than what is going on. And in fact, we estimate that very, very quickly, uh, more than half of all the computing power ever created is going to come online each year, which gives you an interesting thought about obsolescence. You could throw away everything that has ever happened in the past, start new from today, and you would still be able to have a computing base roughly half as powerful as all the computing in existence if you, if you threw away everything that didn't, wasn't exactly one year old. This changes the way in which we start to think about computers and their disposability and the way we address them. What's, in looking at this, a lot of this growth is being driven by, by, like I said, mobile and tablets. Now, on the logarithmic scale, PC compute, scale, compute power dwarfs that of phones and tablets. Despite tablets being more powerful on average than phones, phones, there are just so many more of them. When we talk about clouds, we talk about a million nodes being an extremely large cloud. However, we talk about billions and billions of phones being out there. And these phones are following the same curve. So we expect that, so what does this look like in terms of a projection? Tablets will probably surpass phones relatively quickly because they are more, because they are more powerful. And they will probably be the first one to, to cross over the top of PCs in terms of total compute power available across the world that you could, that you could access at any given time. But, but probably by about 2025, the most, most computing power out there in the entire world is going to be sitting in people's pockets. It's not going to be on their desk. It's not going to be in their cloud. It's not going to be any of the other places where we traditionally think of computers. It is going to be on on people's persons. It's going to be scattered all over the place. But now, this data is obviously highly questionable in the specific. But the trends are strong, and they are clear. And uh, for also, just for people's interest, this is what the what growth curves tend to look like. That's a sort of a best fit line for, for these different things. Now, what does this have to do with data? And the answer is everything. Remember, we have always had to bring data to the computers. And there were studies that were done, there were studies done as recently as 2011 that said, which is better, a bunch of wimpy cores or a strong core? And the answer in 2011 and 2012 was that a single strong core could do more work than equivalent number of WIMPy cores. Um, this was especially when ARM, ARM processors started to become very prevalent. And people thought, what if I packed a whole bunch of ARM processors into a single box? Could I get better price performance than a really powerful Z, uh, Xeon processor or, or whatever, uh, whatever Intel's most recent one is? And the answer was no. And so it was easier to centralize the computing even within a box. But, the chain, but what is happening is that that trend has actually started to change. Not because the WIMPy cores are getting more powerful, because they are, but because we're seeing certain scaling limits associated with bigger processors. And a lot of those have to do with very fundamental physical content. Con Fundamental physical constants. Sorry, I can't even speak. Yeah. 
the speed of light can go about a foot, 13, 13 inches in the time it takes for a single clock cycle. That is the farthest that you can get your electrical signal within that time. Because of that, you can, the bigger and bigger that you make your, your central processor, the more interconnects you need. You have thousands of, uh, you know, you have miles and miles of actually lines inside that processor. And so it takes time to start moving the signals across the processor. This was most clearly shown back in the Pentium 4 days when they included a number of, of, of stages in the processing pipeline just to allow the signals to propagate from one side of the computer to another. When we think about this idea that the WIMPy cores are becoming the more powerful ones in aggregate because they have more headroom and because they're because they are in more places, then we start to think about the way in which we address data and the way in which we address computing. And we need to start rethinking those things. So this gives me the quest, leads to the question, where is data? Now, people shout it out, where is data? Where is data? <laughs> that was not exactly what I was thinking, Steve. <laughs> Um, the, but if, you, if I were to ask you, where's the data? Where would you say it is? Where is it located? Everywhere. The data is everywhere. A lot of the things that we, talk, that we think about are actually, are actually information, product, are information products that are associated with bringing data back into a centralized location in order to do the computing on it. Let's think, for example, about the example from, of this morning, this idea of the connected cows. I loved this example because they strapped essentially a little computer to every single one of these cows, and they brought it all back into a data center, into the cloud, in order to produce really interesting results and really interesting visualizations. But if you think about it, moving the data is actually a very unnatural act. We did, a study, we did a study associated with how people deploy within our data centers. And what we found out is that the single thing that dominates all other costs associated with a customer is the movement of data. Everything else, by extension, is cheap. A lot of you have heard of the thought and the term data gravity. Who, meant, who has heard of this? Ah, not many people. Data gravity is the, is the concept that the more that you have, the more data that you have, the more it tends to draw compute and other data to it. It acts very similarly, actually, as a physical model associated with, if you said data has mass, and the more data it tends to draw things together, then you want to have, then you want to bring your compute and your other data to it. And it costs money to move out of the gravitational well or the data well associated with having data in one particular place. This is why people sometimes say that data is sticky. It also affects your compute. I don't know how many of you, I'm going to see how many people laugh uh, associated with this one. But this is, if there are I mean, not many, many people, but <laughs> this is, to a certain extent, the story of my life. Because you try and do something where you assume that the data is located in one place, or you try and assume that the data is located in the other. And if you run your models in the wrong place, it runs like a dog. It's terrible. It takes forever because the, you are doing the literally the most expensive thing that you can do in a computing, and that is moving data around. So for all of recorded history, we have had this idea of we take the raw output of the world, the labor that is done, the output of sensors, the output of the world, and we transport it to the means of production, these, these computers. 
because the computers have always been where it is. But for the first time, we can ask a different question that has a different answer. That answer question is, where is compute? Compute has always been centralized. But what we are looking forward to, and we are frankly in the age where compute is now decentralized. Compute is everywhere. And let me illustrate this through a series of three, uh, three examples. The first is, this is a projection of, this is a projection of 2.7 billion tweets done in the geographic area of Manhattan over a single month period. One of the things that's interesting is that you can actually deduce a lot of both areas of interest as well as the grid structure of, of Manhattan simply by looking at the, the location of these tweets. Now this visualization was done by aggregating the data uh, up and, and putting it together. But the primary processing of this data, the creation of the tweet, the initial working was actually done on 2.7 billion cell phones or tablets if you want to be one of those people who holds it up and takes pictures with it. Uh, this, it, this was yesterday. This is today. Who knows what this is? That's right. That's a flight data recorder. People think of these as the black boxes of, 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 of planes, and they think, well, they record everything and so you can see it. This is actually a really crappy recorder of data. I was talking with a guy from GE, and he said that the new, that they want to embed compute in their airplanes. And they need to, because the propulsion system alone in a 787 Dreamliner generates five terabytes of data each flight. They throw away all that data because it costs too much to transmit it, it costs too much to process it, and so therefore, it is there for, they, they do some averages and they use it to turn on a light that says, either your, light, your engine is fine or your engine is blowing up. That's all that they do. And if they start, and they said, we want to embed the in processing intelligence in our planes so that when we can start to do meaningful analytics on the plane without having to transmit all that data down into a data center and do something with it. This is data gravity in action. When they do that, they can then start putting out the intelligence that's associated with the analysis of the data and saving really the only important piece. After I had that conversation with the, with the folks from GE, I had folks, a conversation with someone from L3 who actually has a system like this that they put on trains. These, this is currently deployed out in the world. And what they do is they analyze the systems on the train as they are going forward, uh, and they look for anomalies. And this live anomaly detection allows them to either adjust the running mix of the train or to flag it for immediate repair whenever they see something. And they estimate that this saves several millions of dollars per train per year in terms of missed maintenance cost and, increase, and provides greater reliability. This is, be, this is because they put the compute where the data is. How about the future? Let's look at our cows. One of the things that struck me with, with these things was how big they were. And the simplicity of the computation and the measurement that was being associated with the, what, what, was, what was being communicated up. What was communicated, the decision, the intelligence associated with it, it was a single bit of data. It was this cow is an estrus or this cow is not. You can represent that with a single bit. Where was the data? The data was in the field with the cow. You could easily embed a, a computer in that pedometer do the analysis right there on the cow and to have it send a message when it has something interesting to say. Yes, this cow happens to be going into estrus because that was the only thing that they were, that was at least initially, the only thing that they were looking for. 
in doing that, you can actually have a radically cheaper infrastructure because you're not dealing with as much data and you can do it uh, where the data is. You don't move it around. So what does this mean for Python? Because this is PyData after all. First of all, we need to start thinking about Python in the small. A lot of what we are going for here is how can I make Python work on bigger and bigger data sets? Turns out that a lot of the things that we're talking about are going to be associated with small data sets and small devices. And frankly, Python doesn't have a great answer for the most widely deployed of those, the, the mobile devices, although that's being worked on. Interestingly, we do have a very good, uh, we have some very good things when we go a little bit smaller. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, the Microbit, uh, the MicroPython, which runs on a variety of microcontrollers. It's actually really, really good. It makes it very easy to control and run your, your analysis on a tiny, tiny computer that you can embed all over the place. But as data scientists, as engineers, as people who are starting to think about this, you need to start thinking about how can I make my computations and my runtime fit on something that is very small. You also need to start thinking about how does this change the algorithms that you use associated with, with data. And I would suggest that we start looking for ways in which this has changed in the past. Specifically, I think that we're going to need to start looking a lot more at, at an extended form of non-uniform memory access. Now, non-uniform memory access arose it was theoretically available far back, but it really became an issue with the rise of multiprocessors in the late 1990s. Uh, specifically, the Opteron, I, or not the Opteron, the Athlon, I think was the first one to have a, first PC to have a NUMA-aware architecture. You had it in some larger uh, architectures before that. And what they found is that by saying, let's keep the data where as close to a particular processor as we can, they, instead of putting out this abstraction that all memory accesses are the same, they found that they could get from a 7 to a 16 times speed up associated with a, associated with a uniform memory access model. Now, this obviously incre increased overhead because you had to start coordinating what these different processors would do. And as you've added more and more cores, it became more and more difficult. But the fact that you stopped saying data can be anywhere and you started saying my data is here made a huge difference. This is the same leap that we're going to need to start making when we talk about data being everywhere and processing being everywhere. Because it is far more, far cheaper to process the data where it is than to move it, because moving data is the most expensive thing that you will do. Think about, the, think about the Dreamliner. Five terabytes of data is really, really expensive to move off that plane. But the information that you can get out of an analyzing it on the plane, that is small and valuable and can be moved around. The second thing that you can, I think that we're going to need to start looking at are cache oblivious algorithms. Now, a cache oblivious algorithm is, a, is an algorithm that is not tuned to a particular cache size. Instead, what it does is it makes an, the optimal use of any cache that is available of any size, minus some constant, minus some constant factors, but it, uh, it makes certain guarantees about the ability to look, the ability to access certain types of data and look at them in certain, certain ways and says, you know what, it doesn't matter if your data is close or your data is far, I will be able to provide you the best case running time bounded within a certain, within a certain uh, time bound that is possible with the actual location of the data. And it turns out that these algorithms are really, really valuable when you have caches. It sounds like this would be something that you would run on without a cache. No, it means that it makes optimal use of a cache regardless of the size, regardless of where the data is. Now, I want to go one loop around back to this guy. This actually has 
I said that this was going to be just about data and just about computing, but it's also about the social reality associated with the control of information. Even if you go into the pre-computing era, the control of the data, the control of the information has been a key means of political control associated with people all the way back to the Egyptians, to the ancient Egyptians. Having the ability to look at yourself, to analyze yourself, to analyze the world around you, and to do that right where you are is actually tremendously powerful and is tremendously liberating because you don't necessarily need to have all the data in the cloud or to have all the data over there or to have the data someplace else under someone else's control in order to get the answers that you want out of it. You should start thinking about the computing that is available right around you, the answers that are available right around you, and how that can be empowering and interesting for you right now. Questions? <laughs>